You are listening to the ODAT Chat Podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go of what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Hey friends, thank you for downloading the podcast. My name is Arlena and I'll be your host. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to hear more inspiring stories about recovery every week. You can also get them delivered right to your email inbox. Just sign up for the newsletter at odatchat.com. For those of you who know me, you know I can't have an intro without at least one resource. So today I'm going to share an amazing book called Radical Acceptance by Tara Brock. They say acceptance is the key to all our problems. And this book has such deep wisdom that I find myself listening to it over and over again. I actually listened to the Audible version because number one, her voice is so soothing and calming. She's amazing. And number two, because I'm doing the 75 hard challenge and I need something to listen to while I work out. Lord help me. Anyway, if you try it, I hope you like it. Today, my guest is Casey Davidson, life and recovery coach and podcast host of the Hello Someday podcast. Is that the best name for a podcast or what? I love it. Casey is a loving wife and mother of two beautiful kids. She's super smart, creative, and hardworking, yet she struggled with the amount of alcohol she was consuming, and as successful as she was in the corporate world, she knew there was something wrong with the way she was drinking, which began her journey to recovery. Her story is as unique as she is, and I can't wait for you to hear it. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Casey. Well, Casey, thank you so much for joining me on the ODAT Chad podcast. I am so excited to be here, Arlena. It's such a privilege. I met you through She Recovers and um, I did a podcasting class and then we're doing a podcast I want, I want to call it an evil mastermind group, but it's not an evil. evil master, it's definitely a mastermind. <laughs> evil, okay, a mastermind group. We're on a mission to uh, heal the world, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. So you are a sober life coach. You really help professional women gain clarity and focus and help them prioritize what they need to do so they can reach their goals. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. Yeah. I work with yeah. a lot of working moms. So working moms. women who are pretty successful in their careers who climb the corporate ladder, I would say almost all of us sort of identify as people pleasers slash overachievers. <laughs> which is sort of a a pretty common combination. And they're busy. They do everything for everyone else. They try to make sure that all the balls are in the air and yet they feel drained and they feel stuck and they feel, you know, they just don't love their day-to-day life, even though they love all the people and things in it. And really looking at what's behind that. And most of the women, actually all of the women I coach want to quit drinking and they, you know, have gotten to the point where they know that drinking is no longer working in their lives. And yet they have so much fear about quitting, both about what, you know, they wonder, am I bad enough to quit? They wonder um, what it will do to their social life, to their marriage, all their friends drink. They actually worry about whether it will hurt their career to stop drinking, which is crazy, but I had those same fears because, you know, if they stop, somehow that's admitting they have a problem. Um, And, you know, even though you're not going to work hungover and and tired and your brain's sharper and you remember more and, and you don't drink too much at social events with workers, you're worried that if you stop drinking, everybody's going to be like, ooh, what happened? So yeah. Women I work with, yeah, and uh, and just to add on to that piece, it's like I'm in sales, right? Yeah. Like I do, I, I work for a company out of Silicon Valley in high tech sales, and drinking is a big part of the sales career. But I have learned nobody cares. Yeah, nobody cares. Yes. It's like I walk around with a club soda and cranberry with a lime in it, and everyone just assumes it has booze in it. Like, and yeah. nobody cares. It's like, oh, are you, what can I get you to drink? And I'm like, oh, I'm just drinking 
this tonight. I have an early morning and they're like, okay. Well, nobody the people cares. who care have their own issues with alcohol. And right. Yeah. I mean, there's so much there, both about how to talk about it and right. how to stop judging yourself about it, ways to get over being uncomfortable, how to deal with people who do yeah. care. You know, there are certainly <laughs> some, and also how to sort of do the the real observation of once people are three or four drinks in, like you're not really helping yourself in your career anyway. Like people exactly. don't remember what they say. You think they're bonding the next morning and it's cringeworthy. I mean, I certainly had all the cringeworthy moments where mm -hmm. I'm like, this actually, I think it's helping my career. It's not. You know? Yeah, totally not. Yeah. And men can be really inappropriate when they're drinking and oh, it's easy absolutely. to just be like, man, I don't care. You know, like when you're drinking, like, yeah. so yeah, not good, not good for anybody. And especially if you actually do have a problem, what if you, what if you realize, Oh shoot, I do like, I mean, I can't tell you how many like sales kickoffs I've been to where the next day people are like, Oh my God, these two people, did you see those two people? They left together. Like, yes. Everybody knows like, but they were like, wow, they were really drunk and they left together. It's like, everybody knows what happens. It just make, puts you in such a bad light. And people remember that for a decade. I mean, Ever. that is, it is gossiped. Forever. I have a friend who is a strategic sales guy for a very high profile company. And, you know, he's been sober probably 10, 15 years now. And um, people still bring it up to him. The craziness that yeah. was his identity back 20 years ago. Yeah. Still talk and about it. So you know, about. that is not to say that if you're in that place or you've done those things that you need to feel shame and need to worry about it for the rest of your career or life. But it is to say that it's better when you stop drinking, especially if you worry about it and your reputation and your productivity at work and your ability to do your job without so much anxiety is so much improved when you stop drinking. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. And I do feel there is a difference between feeling shame about like if you, if something bad does happen, like there is difference, a difference between feeling shame about it and then using that experience to keep you from doing it again. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Like that's the, that's the purpose of pain. It's like, you don't put your hand on a hot stove because it burns. And yeah. I tell my girls sometimes I'm like, you know what? Let that shit burn you. Let it burn for a minute because yeah. the next time you start to think, well, maybe it'll be okay this time. Or if I'll, I'll just drink a glass of water between, between drinks or you start to think about, and then you go, wait a minute. I am. That was so painful. The last, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. You know? If you let it, burn yeah, and you, I do a lot of like it. reflection, and I do this with my clients too on how fun was it, how good was it. I mean, I definitely remember, you know, couple friends with with younger kids doing a sleepover, right? Like once you have kids, seeing your friends um, is harder, and so we planned this great sleepover at our house. They brought their kids, stayed in our guest room. And I've been looking forward to this for months. And of course, we were drinkers. We started drinking at like 4 p.m. as soon as they got here. And um, I put the kids to bed, read them stories, totally drunk slash buzzed, whatever you want to call it. We weren't driving and fell asleep with them. And With the because, kids? Yeah, because I was drunk. Like, you know, like, like seven I was, or eight at night. It was like nine um, mm -hmm. but my husband and the couple stayed up for hours. They went for a walk in the moonlight. They looked at shooting stars, right? <laughs> I missed all of it, missed all of it and came downstairs in the morning, totally hung over. And my girlfriend who runs marathons was out running. And I just was like, how fun was that? Like I literally blew the night I'd been looking forward to in months. So, you know, in terms Aww. of shame, I feel like doing that, like drinking, not drinking reflection. Because now I do things with my friends all the time. And yes, I don't get that like drunk buzz, but I get so much more. I get to see the shooting yeah. stars. I get to remember it. I feel great in the morning. And once you're sort of over the hump, you get all that true moments of joy and contentment and pride that you don't get when you're drinking. Can't agree more, 100%. Yeah. 
all, all good reasons not to drink, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't usually start the conversation that way, but I'm oh, so sorry. glad that we, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I could talk to you forever. Um, and, and typically we do talk forever. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, what I would love to hear is sort of like a little bit of your background, your experience, your personal experience with drinking, like yeah. how old were you when you started? Like, when did you cross the line? Like if you got to the core issue of why you started in the first place or. Yeah. That kind absolutely. of thing would be great. I'm not going to interrupt you. I'm going to let you tell your story uninterrupted and then I'll, I'll quiz you at the end. <laughs> okay. 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 That sounds good. Yeah. Well, I quit drinking for the last time, knock on wood, uh, four and a half years ago. So I quit when I was 40 years old. I um, did not drink a ton in high school um, because I So I grew up, my parents were in the foreign service. They were diplomats overseas. Um, We moved every two or three years to different countries, different continents. I spent a lot of time, you know, when I was three to five in Mozambique in Southern Africa, and then we moved to Paraguay in South America, and then Zambia in uh, Southern Africa and all around. And so I, when growing up, it was really important that I was sort of the good girl, that I didn't have a lot of needs. My parents were very, very busy um, with their jobs. That was clearly the most important thing in their lives. And um, I just, you know, was the smiley, happy younger sister, mostly because my sister, my older sister, um, had some anger and resentments and about us moving. So, you know, you take on whatever the role is that isn't taken in the family. Um, so, so much of a people pleaser. I remember when I was, you know, eight years old, my parents would go play tennis in Sunday mornings. And we always had like a housekeeper slash nanny, right? My parents had a lot of social events. They worked really late and on weekends. And um, we, um, you know, my parents would go play tennis and I would spend the entire time they were gone cleaning the house. And this, we had a housekeeper, right? Because we lived in South America, super common. And they would come back and I would pretend that I hadn't done it. So they would express all this surprise and joy. And I was eight years old. Like the amount of things that I was doing to get love and attention from my parents were crazy. I have a six-year-old and a 12-year-old now. Trust me, they are not cleaning the house to get my love when I leave the home. Um, So, you know, there was a lot of like worry that if I wasn't good enough, I wouldn't have security. Um, emotional or even physical when I was eight years old, um, we were going to move again. And the way the foreign service works is you basically bid on posts and they tell you where you're going to go. And my parents were both in the foreign service. My mom also worked, which was somewhat unusual. So they needed to get postings together. So I remember when I was eight, um, the choices were Zambia in South in Southern Africa, which is where we ended up going or um, Saudi Arabia. And my parents told me and my sister, very matter of fact, that if we moved to uh, Saudi Arabia, she and I would go to boarding school five days a week and take the train home on the weekends. And the amount of anxiety and stress and hurt that came from that was just unprocessed and real. So, you know, I basically you know, went to boarding school when I was in high school, my sister and I did not have, you know, we were not for some reason, each other's soft place to fall. Um, Later, we kind of figured out why a little bit more. But, you know, she thought, um, you know, I was always trying to get my parents positive attention, and she was trying to get their attention in negative ways. So I went to boarding school, a different boarding school than she did. It was my choice in a different state. And it was months after I turned 14. And I've pretty much been on my own since then. I would visit my parents three times a year and, you know, remember very clearly talking to them on a payphone for 10 minutes once a week. So I was very successful. I got a, you know, I got all A's. I 
was always trying to ingratiate myself to my friends and my friends' parents so that I would have somewhere to go on long weekends when the campus shut down. And I just had all this internal anxiety. Like I call it hypervigilance. Um, I felt like I needed to check things 17 times to make sure I was right and not going to let anything falling through the cracks. I mean, I had to fly down to Brazil when I was 14 years old by myself. I didn't speak Portuguese. I somehow once left my ticket and my passport in a phone booth in Rio de Janeiro, which is a huge um, airport and was just in tears and beside myself. And so all that is say, I didn't drink a lot in high school, almost at all, mostly because I was terrified of getting expelled or suspended. I had nowhere to go in my mind. And so super good girl. And then senior year, actually junior year, now that I think about it, I went to my girlfriend's house and her parents were somehow away and there were seven of us and we drank. And it was like my first time drinking. And for some, I just wanted to get drunk. I wanted to get drunk so bad to get out of my own head and to like have fun and have adventures and not be so responsible. So we played drink while you think what, you know, that thing, um, that game with, um, you know, your red solo cups with Bacardi rum. Like it was not beer. And I was so excited to get drunk and to be bad. I blacked out the entire night. Um, I apparently threw up all night long all over myself. I was trying to climb up a small hill for the whole night. My friends carried me to bed. Um, and I was so brutally hung over the next day. I thought I was going to die. And my da- so that was my first time drinking. My dad picked me up the next day. I, ha- I adored my father adored him, like just wanted his love and attention so bad. And he did love me. He was affectionate. He just was never there. And he picked me up for, it was my sister's high school graduation weekend. And I was, you know, 16. So it was like, Casey, you can drive. I was shaking. I was awful. I um, had to somehow pretend I wasn't hungover and like pull over on the side of the road to throw up in the woods. Um, I know it's bad, your, your face. And so um, I went to my sister's graduation. My mother was there and my father was there and my grandparents. I mean, I had not seen my parents in four months um, until that day. And I remember my sister, I spent the whole time like desperately trying not to throw up. My sister was walking down the path with her graduating class. And I jumped up. I ran in front of them to the side of the building, threw up on the side of the building. I'm sure everyone could see, ran around, threw up on the back of the building. Um, So that was my first time drinking. I came back to the seats. I mean, so desperately tried to play off that I've never told this story outside of like friends and family. So this is crazy that I'm going down here. Um, And my mother, the only thing she said to me, my dad thought it was very funny. And the only thing my mother said to me was, you could have picked a more appropriate time. Like that was it. Um, My dad thought it was hysterical. Um, My dad's favorite line, and again, I adored him, was the line from Animal House that was, my advice to you is to start drinking heavily. Um, he thought it was funny. He was not, he did not have a drinking problem. He was not a big, you know, they always had wine at dinner. That was like always in my household growing up. The adults had wine at dinner. I thought that's what they did. They had big dinner parties, you know, in the diplomatic corps with guests. It was part of their job. There was always like talking and revelry. And I used to like go to sleep with that and think that was the best sound in the whole wide world, adults talking and clinking glasses and just the loudness of voices in the home. Um, But he wasn't, you know, neither of my parents had a drinking issue. My sister doesn't. Um, But for me, uh, that was both, you know, you would think that would turn me off from drinking. It did not. I mean, it should have. Oh my God, I was so ill and mortified and embarrassed. And, you know, my goal is to have my parents think I'm amazing. And clearly that was not what happened. Um, But 
you know, I was so wanting to get out of my own head and wanting to get out of my own responsibility and wanting to not be hyper vigilant about everything. And so um, I went to college, you know, again, like just super. I felt like I had I had to be responsible for myself. I had to find someone to take me in. I had to, where was I going to live this summer after college? Um, all the things. And so I went to college and, um, you know, joined, I, in high school, I played field hockey and lacrosse. And in college, I decided to play women's rugby. Um, a, they hung out with the boys and I was like, not that comfortable with boys. They had these incredible rituals that now I cringe. I mean, cringe. Um, you know, all, we sang all these songs that are um, total rape culture songs. I mean, I was, you know, just, you don't even want to know the lyrics, but they are, um, I won't say them because they're so inappropriate. I still memorized all the songs. Um, and it was really fun, but we would go on keg runs after every game. We would party with the other team and party with the boys. And these were like sing song, trug, uh, chug drinks. Um, the goal was almost to black out and throw up. There was a thing called boot and rally where you drink, throw up, keep drinking. That was very celebrated. Um, we used to chug if you scored a, a goal, a try out of an old cleat, it was called shooting the boot. Um, you know, we did keg stands. We did, um, some guys would get naked in a song that encouraged people to take off their clothes. It was always the guys. So that's somehow better. And then we'd pour all beer all over their naked bodies. So just to say it was a big drinking culture. Um, and that's probably too much information. Um, but I was a very, very still good girl, like good girl, like, um, you know, the hangovers, the gray outs, but I never did. I was never promiscuous. I, barely went home with people. I didn't even lose my virginity until I was senior in college. Like I was just a good girl um, because I think I was so worried about being embarrassed and worried about not being in control. So drinking was my way to let loose and to get out of my own head and to be a rebel. And so that's what I did. And I also spent every night not around the keg in the library, got straight A's, all the things. Um, so I loved it. And then I graduated college and again, was super worried I'd have nowhere to go. Like other people were going home and I just was like, I have to get a job. I have to figure out where to live. My parents were in Australia and Mozambique at the time. They got separate, um, separate assignments um, very different continents. And, um, I moved down to DC. I got my first job at a consulting firm and, um, worked. And my first assignment was a nightmare. It was, um, calling Germany at three in the morning to find out in German air purification, respirated manufacturing stuff. I mean, it was ridiculous. And I felt like I had to do a great job and I had to get all the information and it had to be right. And so I would go home at night in my basement apartment and I would drink red wine and I couldn't even cook. I'd been to boarding school, high school and college, like eating in dorms. Like I literally didn't know how to make anything. I made mac and cheese and, um, and drank red wine. And that was my drinking. I felt sophisticated. It helped me not worry about my job. My dad that year got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and was told he had six months to live and he was in Australia. And my mother told me not to come home. She said, you have a job, you have to be responsible. Um, you know, my sister also Try. I think she'll never see this, tried to commit suicide in high school. And I was in Germany at the time on uh, exchange. And I desperately wanted to come home. I was beside myself. My parents were in Brazil at the time. They went to see her and again, told me not to come back. They told me they, they just needed to focus on my sister. And, you know, in my mind, they couldn't deal with me. 
even though I needed to be with her. Um, we had talked the day before on the phone, the day before she tried to kill herself. And she, I had no clue. She told me I needed to be strong. And, you know, so I just, it was hard. And yet I was like, what do I have to complain about? My life is so good. I have a job, you know, in my family, like being, feeling sorry for yourself or not being strong or not looking on the positive was not allowed. And so, or encouraged, it was just like, you know, we were sort of waspy, like, you know, don't talk about things, like put a happy face on it. Like it was just, and my parents loved me. I mean, they did. And my mom is wonderful and intelligent and driven and, you know, all the things she just, for me, wasn't the soft place to fall. And never, you know, it, whether that was her, whether that was me, I mean, they just weren't home. They weren't around. Um, and it, that's just a fact. So I started drinking wine every night and I was so nervous about work that I would drink the night before business trips. And I would literally be up all night dry heaving, like throwing up yellow bile, before I had to go on a plane to New York City to American Express at the age of 25 and present. And in my mind, it was almost a strategy. Like I would be so hungover and trying not to be ill that I couldn't be worried about presenting. I mean, it was just so convoluted. Um, and I, looking back, I can't imagine how much I, how much harder I was making everything for myself my whole life and how much I was self-sabotaging um, and, you know, now fueling my anxiety and making myself so physically ill all the time. And, you know, then I met my husband, my boyfriend at the time. We moved out to Seattle together. I never would have left my job, even though I didn't love it because I was so security oriented. Um, but he was going to leave and said, you're coming with me or you're not. And I was like, okay. Um, and so, you know, I got a great job. They moved me out here. I worked in tech and I just drank every night. I mean, at the time we were young, we had fun. We would go kayak, but like every night we drank. Um, and it was like us playing grown up. And that was just my life for the next Till I was 40, right? We went on wine tasting weekends. We had dinner parties with tons of wine. We had beer at football games. We went kayaking and drank in the kayaks. Like it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And I knew it was a problem, right? I also, but I, I didn't know that for a long time. I thought it was normal. I surrounded myself with a ton of drinkers. I, of course, woke up at 3 a.m. with crushing anxiety and thought it was my job and thought I was just working so hard. I went to therapists and got sleeping pills. You know, like I didn't actually put it together. I didn't put together the anxiety and the 3 a.m. wake ups with my drinking. I literally thought drinking was helping me um, cope with my life and cope with my stress. My dad actually ended up living six years with pancreatic cancer. It was incredible. He got, um, he had, uh, he had a Whipple procedure back in the early days, never did chemo until the end. His last three years were like experimental treatments and, and not good. But, um, but for three years he was good. He moved to Mozambique. He lived with my mom while she was working. Um, we joke, he was the house husband. He like print, you know, got all the newspapers when she was at work in the morning, highlighted all the relevant articles so she could come home and read them. I mean, my parents are a little weird. Um, and so, um, he, you know, he ended up getting sick and dying when I was 29 and again, totally crushing to me, but I drank my way through it. Um, and, you know, would get drunk a bottle of wine and would cry and all the things. And then the next morning would pull myself together. And um, that was just me. I had my son when I was 32. Um, and 
that was the time that I read Drinking a Love Story on my Kindle and just wrote myself a letter in a Word doc saying, I think I have a drinking problem. I think this is bad. I mean, every word of it resonated with me and I need to stop. And then like five days later, later, I went back into that Word doc. I still have it and wrote, just kidding, not a problem. I was overreacting. <laughs> I literally wrote myself like, no, 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 you don't have a problem. Um, and, you know, I was 32. It took till I was 38 to finally do my sustained first attempt at quitting drinking. And um, the whole time I thought all my issues were work-related, right? I worked in tech. There were a ton of layoffs. Um, I had a little kid. It was stressful. Like all the things you think are the issues and that I drank every wine and the wine every night because it was my one treat because I didn't get to go to yoga or go to guitar lessons or all the things I used to do. Um, But it was getting worse and worse. Um, I was feeling doomed. I was feeling like I couldn't cope with life. I was having, you know, the little and big things started to slip. I was having a lot of conflict with my new male boss who was in sales. I was in product marketing, very different, very oil and water um, at work. Um, And I sort of got counseled out of my very high level job that I'd been at for five years. And we decided to separate the company and myself. And I got, you know, four months paid. Um, And so I was like, I got to get my shit together. Um, I went to a therapist and said, okay, I've got all these things I want to work on. I have this stressful job. I have a little kid. I have so much anxiety, so much on my shoulders, you know, all the things. And by the way, I drink too much. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about your drinking. He was an AA and I'd specifically chosen him because he said he worked with anxiety and addiction, right? So I wanted to talk about my anxiety, but was honest about my drinking. And he encouraged me to go to AA. I also found for the first time an online secret Facebook group that I adore called the Booze Free Brigade, the BFB. And shared my story there, you know, with a picture of me and my, my son who was five at the time and said, here's what's going on with me. I'm, you know, 38 and I have a beautiful five-year-old and I'm married and I drink a bottle plus of wine a night and my anxiety is off the chart and I'm worried about it, but I'm terrified and I desperately don't want to stop drinking. And 25 women said me too. And 25 women said, my story is just like yours. And 25 women said, your son is beautiful and it's going to be okay. And I get it and just don't drink and we'll hear for you and post every day. Like I was in tears. I took screenshots of every single comment and posted them in a word doc. Okay. I was kind of a word doc girl. Um, And Um, so I was on, I've been on the BFB since then. That was God, seven years ago. Um, they held me up and supported me. And, and there was a woman on there who was my age and a lawyer and lived in Seattle and she went to AA and she was four months sober. So she invited me to AA. I was sort of like, well, bucket list. Never thought I'd do this. You know, like check that one off. Um, so I went with her. She um, she was wonderful. Um, I went to AA for maybe four or five months. I went. I was off work, so I went four times a week to midday women's meetings. I went to a lot of big book study meetings, which for me I think might have been a mistake. Um, I was um, still am. I'm not very religious. I don't love organized religion. Um, I, you know, just, it's not my bag. And for better or worse, the big book reminded me a lot of that. Um, I just didn't. And I know you're an AA or Lena and adore it. And it's wonderful. And I know so many women who have been so helped by it. Um, where I was at the time, and I don't think it's unusual for people to come in this way. I just didn't buy into a lot of the dogma, um, a lot of the philosophy. I had a lot of resistance there. I didn't want to say I was an alcoholic. 
Um, I wasn't even sure I was an alcoholic. And to this day, I just don't think the word is useful to me. I just don't think it's necessary for me. I know, you know, in my mind, I don't fuck with alcohol anymore. It is not, it's dangerous to me. I clearly was addicted to it, but in my mind, I became addicted to an addictive substance, which is exactly what it's designed to do. So, you know, I don't think that you stop smoking and say you're a nicotine alcoholic. Like just for me, that's my bag. So I didn't love saying that. I was such a people pleaser that of course I did. Um, and I got a sponsor. I did a first couple steps and then I got pregnant with my daughter and um, went back to work at a corporate job that was a long commute away and kind of was like, okay, you know, my boss actually at my corporate job um, was in AA, had quit drinking 20 years before. She knew I talked to her about it. We'd worked together many times before. So she was kind of my support um, and my accountability. Um, plus I was pregnant. So, I mean, I just didn't drink for a year. I, and I was healthier and happier and kind of after the year decided that, oh, just kidding. I don't have a problem with alcohol. I was just in a really stressful place. Um, I'm better now. And the truth is I just wanted to drink. I mean, that is the truth. And, um, I was kind of shocked that my husband and other people let me do the like slow shuffle away considering I'd been to AA. I mean, you know, it's like, that's not a small step. Um, I went back to drinking for about 22 months and really quickly it was a bottle of wine a night or more with a tiny baby and a kid, you know, who was six. Um, and the whole time I knew it was unsustainable the whole time I, I, you know, they say recovery ruins you for drinking. I knew too much. Um, I never in those 22 months had a picture of me with a wine glass on social media. Like I was very careful. I would go to the grocery store and buy the six pack, you know, because you got 10 minutes X, you know, 10% off if you get six and would buy it and lay it down and hide it with my grocery bags and look around when I was checking out in case anyone from AA was there. I mean, just the ridiculousness of it all. And finally at 20, when she was 22 months old, I just felt doomed. And I felt like I was really going to fuck up my life and my marriage and my kids. And it was going to be my fault. And I was worried for my mental health. I really was. I, you know, would go to work and something would happen. And I would think I want to shoot myself, which you know me, Arlena, I am a very optimistic, happy, positive person. And it was all the alcohol. And so I, I, um, I hired a coach. Um, I, um, had heard about this hundred day sober challenge. I signed up for it. I sent her an email. Um, I did phone calls with her. I said I was going to do a hundred days. I went back to the booze free brigade, checked in there every day. And that was my last day one. Um, I did a hundred days. Then I said, okay, I'm going for six months. Then I said, okay, I'm going for a year. And then I said, I'm done. So that's my story. That was probably longer than you wanted. Wasn't I was hanging on your every word. That was amazing. Um, and I have so many questions. I was taking oh, notes. No. Did you not see me taking all these notes? No, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't? <laughs> no. I like a page and a half. Oh no, I mean, oh my gosh. As, as you were talking about how you grew up, I mean, I wanted to cry a little bit when you were talking about just the impact of the absentee parent, right? Yeah. And it wasn't that, I mean, you're very clear that your parents loved you uh, when you were with them, but to not be a priority, I mean, I know you to be a, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I know you to be a child-centered family. Oh, we are. I, you know, you always want to give people what you don't have. And I'm such a nester yeah. now. And like just yeah. seeing my kids sleep through the night like a baby without anxiety is yeah. just the best feeling in my whole life. Yeah. And I am all, we are also a child, child centered family. Like our, you know, we both grew up with parents that were absent, not out of neglect, but, you know, out of necessity. Right. Yeah. Like, um, and I so don't my, my, think that a lot of people see parents who are absent 
as traumatizing, right? You're always like, it's well, my parents so were is. an alcoholic. You, you know, parents who work too much. I mean, my parents worked a ton. Um, you know, whether you're high income or low income, it's a, a parents who aren't there emotionally, like you kids need that. They need to know they're emotionally safe. And that, you know, it wasn't until I went to therapy when I quit drinking that my therapist was like, that's traumatic. That what you so went traumatic. through is traumatic. And I didn't think that it was. I was like, I literally was like, why can't I cope with life? What is wrong with me? Was like the running tape in my head. Yeah. You were never taught any coping skills. I yeah. mean, that comes from your family, right? I don't think your housekeeper or your nanny was necessarily teaching you coping skills. Just no. a guess. No. Nope. Yeah. Um, so, and it's interesting because, um, my last interview was uh, with Busy from Busy Living Sober. You oh. have to meet her. She's amazing. I'll introduce you. But um, she also had that experience of um, idealizing the adults with the parties and the clinking glasses and the yeah. and the and the giggling and the laughter that you know it's so in the beautiful dresses and it looks all fabulous, right? Like you don't see what happens, you know, at 2 a.m. when people are puking in the bushes or people are hung over the next day. I mean, obviously not everybody is, but um, yeah, just like that sort of thinking like, oh, that looks so fun type yeah. of thing. Um, but I want kind of want to go back to some of the things that you were talking about. Um, so that really struck me the whole absent parent thing and that you were on your own at such a young age. Um, and you talked about you and your sister not being the soft place to fall. And it's, um, there was this therapist in the seventies or eighties. His name is Terry Bradshaw, not the football player. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but he talked about the baby mobile, like baby, like families are like that mobile, meaning the family maintains balance, right? And it's so yeah. interesting because, you know, so you were the good girl and seeking attention in a positive way and your sister was the polar opposite. You guys were keeping balance in the family. And it's interesting because in recovery, when one person starts changing, everybody else doesn't, like everybody has to change to accommodate that balance. So it's it's really interesting how recovery affects the family later on. But um, so it sounds like you were the only one that had like a, can we call it an alcohol use disorder? Oh God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll call it that. <laughs> I, and actually, no, I have a no question that I was addicted to alcohol and should never drink again. I mean, there's no, yeah. and that the, you so know, it's just I took, the word alcoholic. It's just that you don't the like. word. It's just the word. And it's so funny because um, it's like the word God, right? It's just, it's an inanimate, it's um, of itself, it doesn't have, the only meaning that it has is the meaning that you assign to it. And I've heard that if you have a problem with God, typically you have a problem with somebody else's God, right? Yeah. Like God is, God is an experiential um paradigm it's totally. you know it's typically handed down through families because that's a big part of mindset and um, operating instructions right yes this, this is how our family operates yeah. that's what religion I think was intended for uh, but it's so um it's so funny to hear I know that you had some experience with some on, I'm not going to name any names but some yeah. online rec um, programs that uh, whole, wholly reject traditional 12 step programs based on this idea of not wanting to break down the ego or rejecting the term alcoholism or, um, you know, very small parts of a large solution. Yes. Um, you know, we talked earlier about some traditional literature that talks about chapter to the wives. Yes. And it's like, oh, I'm going to take a stand on this one chapter and wholly reject the whole thing. Yes. Because, so, I mean, there's all these, all these feel like, oh, I'm yeah. so uncomfortable and, right now. I know. I know. Um, You're very and, respectful and, and I don't. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I hear you though. And I also, I mean, I do feel like when I was in AA and even now, like I've taken so many of their things to heart. And I use them um, in my daily life. I also coach women who go to AA and I always encourage it. And I encourage yeah. women who are 
not able to stay sober, um, you know, I always feel like you just need to add layers of support and AA is a great support. Um, For me, you know, when you were talking about it's just a word, like God, like alcoholic, and it's whatever you apply for it, in my mind, if I don't resonate with that word, or if I don't want to adopt that label, same thing, right? It's just a word. It doesn't change how I think about my relationship with drinking. It doesn't change how I identify or know my truth about that it does not work with me and that it's addictive and it's progressive and the elevator only goes down to um, borrow a phrase. But again, it's just a word. And I think if I choose not to use it, that's okay. I mean, I feel like absolutely. I yeah. also want to, you know, in coaching, you want to look forward. And I don't want to label myself based on who I, what I don't want. I mean, you know, the idea right, of right, like, right, right. Yeah. if you drink again, you'll die. Um, keep coming, you know, just the idea of fear. I want my life to be lived by my hopes, not my fears. So that's how yeah. I move forward. No, I really love that. And I don't mean to despair. I am not by any means disparaging any um, way that people uh, find solution and peace. And um, yeah. and so I, I wholeheartedly, because everybody's different. And that's it's so funny. I feel like I straddle the fence personally um, because there's so much of like, I feel like I see both sides. Like yeah. there's so much to the traditional, uh, pro, you know, ways of recovery that are amazing. Yes. Uh, clearly yeah. there's lots of things I don't like about it. Like I don't like the dogma. I don't like the, um, it's interesting because, um, anonymity is the foundation of a yes. traditional 12 step program, but that also is, Built in with that is sort of like this shame concept that if you need to keep it a secret, like they say you're only sick as your secrets, yeah. but let's not tell anybody. Yeah, it's that a you're, secret. Yeah, anonymity is a spiritual foundation of all the, you know, I can And I know it. that's to protect others, which is so good and true. Well, but I mean, so it's funny because you like need a safe place at first, yeah. right? When you're just so full of shame, it's like, I need a safe place where I can dump this shit where I know it's not going to, I'm not going to be exposed publicly yeah. before I'm ready, right? Like, never mind that I drank, um, I know, to a blackout in public at work in front of my boss. And but like, you know, now I'm going to be anonymous, right? <laughs> Right. But now it's like, oh my God, I feel so much shame. I can't. So it's just this weird. And so, yeah, it's a very interesting, complex situation, but I do see the need for people to have a safe place. Um, And yeah, it seems like not drinking. It's so weird because like, if you admit at work that you smoke weed and I think attitudes are changing, like it's like such a bad thing to admit that yeah. you do drugs. Yeah. But um, if you don't drink, like, ooh, suddenly that's like, oh, yeah. why? What's what wrong? What happened? Are you sure you don't want one? Like, yeah. A problem? Absolutely. And, and yeah, one of so the weird. reasons that I like the approach I finally took So, you know, it's not just one thing that helps you stop drinking, right? I did quite a few things. One, I did go to AA and it did help me and it opened my eyes and met good people and realized, you know, I took a lot of those philosophies away and and that was a huge part of like the idea that recovery- like, leave the rest. ruins you for drinking. That, like I said, my online group, um, I was a member there for the year that I- quit drinking. Mm -hmm. And the entire time I was drinking, I didn't post because I was embarrassed and felt shame and also felt like it wasn't okay because I didn't have the intention of stopping drinking right then. I wanted to keep drinking. And yet I read, I knew, I knew they were there for me. I, um, and I remember posting again when I was on day five, when I had, and it was reading the group at three in the morning when I woke up the night before 
was my last day one, that there was someone else on day one and someone else suggested a sober coach. And Mm -hmm. I wrote them the next day at 10 a.m. So, um, you know, it was the BFB, my online group that helped me get sober. It was my sober coach and listening to audios and podcasts and writing her every day and doing coaching calls with her. It was, um, you know, all the books, the quit lip books. It was, uh, quit lip meaning, um, oh, books like, yeah, books, books of by my, drinking books and memoirs. memoirs of women who had quit drinking or telling their stories about, um, drinking and what it you know, what you do in AA, right? What it was like, what happened, and what's it like now? Like, those are the memoirs. I remember listening to them on audiobooks when I was rocking my daughter to sleep. So you do, mm. you know, even without AA, you immerse yourself in the stories of other women and men. I loved Dry by Augustine Burroughs. Like that was amazing to me. Um, I listened to Blackout by Sarah Heppola. I listened to, obviously, reread Drinking a Love Story. I, um, Claire Pooley's The Sober Diary. I mean, all the things, Elizabeth Vargas's Between Breaths, even um, Abby Wambach's book Forward, she had a drinking problem and and is sober. Like all of those things help me. And it is like AA, you hear their stories, you hear what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Um, and the online connections, you know, similar to AA fellowship, you know, you connect. But for me, also as a working mom with a two-year-old, I was able to listen to that stuff when I was driving to my morning workout on a walk to Starbucks in the middle of the day while rocking my daughter to sleep. I could check the BFB and check in when I was at a work happy hour from the bathroom when I was at a dinner party and was going crazy. Like that, I feel like, you know, I truly am an advocate of like whatever, whatever, if you have a problem with drinking, which I certainly did, whatever helps you stop drinking is what works. And I feel, yeah. you know, I feel like in the same way, some people are so loyal to AA and their home group. And of course they are. I feel that way about the BFB. Like it was whatever helped you in the moment when you were ready to say enough, like that moment of clarity mm-hmm. is what was your patchwork of recovery? And I, right now I do share, and I shared long before I became a coach. Um, I would say, I, yeah, I used to drink a lot and I quit. I feel better. I sleep better. My anxiety is less. And, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people that opens up for them, even if they're not about to quit, like I've had women be like, oh yeah, I've taken periods without alcohol. I have to watch it too. Like, or I also have anxiety. I totally get that. You know, when you talk about going to therapy and you talk about medications, like it, you're so much more honest with people and vulnerable. And I don't tell everyone the story because um, mm-hmm. they don't need to hear it and they don't deserve it. Um, but pe- people who are curious, I do share. And I think it helps people when you talk about the anonymity versus just being open like the way I feel like I am. I've had so many people. I even finally posted on Facebook when I was like a year sober. And one of the big reasons was I was like, oh yeah, the college girls at rugby, like we, it was like a breeding ground for problematic drinking. I mean, there is no question. And I was like, I wonder if any of them are sober. I literally wanted to make old friends and my old coworkers. I was like, yeah, we drink a lot. I wonder if any of them are sober. And I did have some reach out to me. That's amazing. Um, I did want to ask you about, uh, you know, you talked about rape culture in those, <laughs> in the cringy songs. Just in the and you were like, You were like, oh, you don't want to hear in the lyrics. I was all, hell yeah, I do. Maybe you can send me a little bit of the lyrics and I'll post them in the show notes. That would oh my be God. Awesome. Do you want me to say them or is that totally inappropriate? Go ahead and say it. Yeah. Well, one of them was... <laughs> 
shit, damn, fuck, damn, fuck, damn, damn. Some motherfucker just <laughs> fucked my man. I'll fuck another fucker better than the other fucker. Shit, damn. And another one was like, roll me over in the clover. Roll me on <laughs> my poor mother. Roll me over, lay me down, and fuck me hard. Well, you oh. know, like, <laughs> like it was true. And I was. And you managed to be a virgin through all that. Oh, yeah. I was a total virgin. And it was like, was it was like my rebel. And those are like, some of the better ones, like for real. And oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super um, fun. Okay. Send me the X rated one. I don't email. know. That was part of them. But like, <laughs> should, should, why not? Right. I, sorry to anyone who, and I'm like such a good girl. Like it was part of my like, which is hilarious because, well, I mean, you just can't, it's not human nature to just be so repressed, right? And it's like, you were so repressed for so long, like that had to come out somewhere. I mean, that's why preacher's daughters are always so scandalous. So the Catholic girls are so scandalous sometimes because it's like, repression is not a good thing. It's, it's I was like denial. able to totally rebel and say the things that I was not doing in a way that was structured, like in a way that it was like, I guess it's sort of like sororities and fraternities. I wasn't a part of them, but it was like, there was ritual, there was song, Mm -hmm. like you had the moves that you did. You had the, it was like call and repeat sort of like church, but totally different, you know? Yeah. Community and yeah. Like being a (laughs) member of something like, you know, Everybody it's needs not a tribe. It was yeah. like the girls' team and the boys' team with the songs, the girls' team and the other teams. Like you would go to schools, and after the games, we would all sing together. And when you talk about like looking back, oh God, my kids, and not, I'm not embarrassed about me. Like I would literally kill them if they ever, like my 12, 12 year old son, like I would just be like, Oh no, you didn't. That is rape culture. That is X, Y, Z. That is totally inappropriate. Like I was talking to someone and they said nagging wife and I was cringing. So upset about the, when I think about the (sighs) shit that I sang, like, holy crap. So, (laughs) you know, in the theory of like, when we know better, we do better and frontal lobe development and and 18 year olds is not there and consequences and awareness, like, Yikes. (laughs) Yikes. <laughs> you know? I know. It's like, oh my gosh, I, you know, kids really do need both parents. They need to be present, you know, and and they um, need to be made aware of, of the implications beyond what you say and that it's not mm-hmm. harmless. And I'm like raising my hand is like, you thank God there was no social media. Thank God. Oh, oh my God. I'm so grateful I got sober before Facebook. Right. And and smartphones. Um, okay. Well, I'm so, I'm going to have to list all those books that you mentioned in the show notes. Those are amazing books. Um, and, um, yeah, the other, the last thing I wanted, and and thank you for going there with me about the sort of the traditional 12 steps and this, there is like this new way of recovery that, has all the basic structure and principles of 12 step recovery um, without, you know, the things that you were mentioning, you know, we can reframe um, a thought and call it alcohol use disorder. We can um, talk about concepts like you mentioned uh, the hangovers were a distraction from your anxiety. And it's my deepest belief that that is the whole purpose of alcoholism and addiction is to distract us from the, the suffering. It's like not why the Gabor Mate says, you know, don't ask why the addiction ask why the pain. And, you know, it's shifting that focus to something that's more solution oriented. Right. When it's a maladaptive coping strategy. I mean, you do it because it works for a while and then it doesn't work. Right. The price tag, everything comes with a price tag and the price tag of using alcohol as a coping skill is so high. It's so The high. price tag is too high and there's other ways of coping that, that don't have that same sort of price tag. Um, but you talked about, you know, the online groups and having a sober coach and those, all those things contain the elements required yes. for recovery. You know, the self-examination, the coming to peace with your past, the unpacking the baggage, making restitution. It's like, it doesn't matter where those 
things happen no. as long as they happen, right? Oh, and I also and so, did therapy and went on anti-anxiety oh, yeah. meds and joined a 5.30 yeah. a.m. workout group and yeah. worked out four times a week, which helped immensely with my anxiety and also meeting yeah. people who didn't drink. I mean, there were so many layers of support in my life that I had to add piece by piece by piece because when you remove the alcohol, everything that drove you to drink is still there. Um, the way your life is set up, changing how you interact with your boss, how you, how much you give, setting up boundaries, being scared of them, deciding to opt out of relationships that don't lift you up, like all the things. So it is not in any way I quit drinking because it wasn't working for me. Yes, that's what I did. And then you deal with your habits and your emotions and your anxiety and your friendships and your relationship and boundaries. I mean, you know, all the shit that is a human condition. I actually feel sorry, not sorry, but people who never have to stop drinking often never do this work, which improves exactly, their life yeah. so deeply. Yeah, it does. It does. It's, it's really, it's really a gift. And, you know, there's this book by um, Ryan holiday called the obstacle is the way. Right. Yeah. And I think of, you know, my journey with alcohol and where it led me and how it's actually transformed my life and made me useful in a way like unique, you are uniquely useful, right. Yeah. Because of your experience, I am uniquely useful because of my experience and it has opened up a whole new path for, for both of us. Right. And I just want to just focus in on a couple of things you said, because you're really addressing two hugely important things as a, you know, life coach, recovery coach is just making the decision, getting clarity on, is this a problem, right? Like I remember before I joined a 12 step group that I had, I went through a two year period contemplating my drinking is it a problem? When did I cross the line? Have I crossed the line? What about all these other people around me that are drinking like me? And like, it started this series of questions, right? But it took me two years to overcome this hurdle. Oh my God. I think it took me like six (sighs) years. So you are on the uh, fast track there. I just crashed and burned really hard at a <laughs> low threshold for pain. I did not manage well. Um, but the other piece as a recovery coach is support to manage that transition for all yes. the reasons that you said. So those, I think, are two huge um, things, two, two big ways that you can help people is the de- coming to the conclusion, like gaining that clarity and then how to manage it once you make that decision. That's hugely important. I think it's like holding someone's hand through the process, both helping them see the vision of what they want for their life. Where do they want to go? What do they want? And that is individual, right? I don't tell anyone where they want to go in life. You know, you know how you're feeling now and what you actually hope and dream for your life. And I always say that not drinking is the foundation for everything else you want in life. It is. Yeah. If you have a problematic relationship with drinking, remove that and everything else will get better. Your job, your relationship with your kids, your level of anxiety, your sleep, your overall health, your optimism, your yeah. marriage. But then there's all the other stuff that was leading you to cope poorly by using alcohol. So yeah. then that's where coaching's lovely to actually yeah. say, what are your assumptions and limiting beliefs and fears and all the things keeping you small? And what if you released your potential? And by the way, let's hold your hand through your first dinner party and your first family Christmas because there's or holiday, whatever it is, there's all the family stuff there and through triggers and through job changes and marriage challenges, like all the things, but with a view to not therapy going back to solve underlying dysfunction and understanding why it's looking forward with coping skills and how do you want to approach this? And is there a healthier way that gets you a better outcome? You know, I love coaching. Um, I go to therapy yeah. and I love yeah. coaching. They're, they're not either or. No, no, no. Um, I remember one time a friend of mine said, um, oh yeah, there's like 40 different modalities for healing. And, 
you know, 12 steps was like pretty low on the list. And I was, at first I was all, oh, but then I did the, you know, I cl- had to clutch my pearls <laughs> 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 because part of me is super indoctrinated, right? Oh my God. I always, I always have like this very, I love like, the image of, my- of the people at AA meetings clutching their pearls because <gasps> it's so counterintuitive and yet I totally see it. Oh my God. So just a little side story. Um, It's so funny how prudish people can get so quickly. Considering their history, right? Considering Considering the stories you hear. My favorite, I know my favorite line when I'm sharing my story, Saturday night, I'm doing a speaker meeting where I'm speaking for an hour and I'm going to tell the whole story, all the dirt. And um, I love my favorite line to share because it, it ruffles people's feathers is that when I was drinking, that if it was in a bottle, a bag, or blue jeans, I was doing it. <laughs> I love that. And the look on people's faces is like, oh my God. And this what are you like, like, tell me you didn't too. Like, whatever. Bitch, please. I was like, <laughs> oh my God. And this lady comes up to me one time and she's like, oh my God, I was so embarrassed for you the first time I heard you say that. And I was like, okay, I didn't realize the only virgin in the AA was in the room. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize you were currently a nun. Yeah. That I is, like, I love, oh. I love. I'm like, you know, you, you sucked a dick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Apparently this isn't explicit. Although like, yeah. <laughs> when I think about my rugby strange, songs, but yeah, that is funny. <laughs> that is funny. I was like, come on. Mm. Come on. Anyway, I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> no, we're very, I'm very of reverence, but, uh, which, you know, makes things kind of fun, right? It's like, mm-hmm. I, I like to look at, at both sides of the thing. Anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> back to center. <laughs> I was going to say, like, I had you on my podcast and it was all about self-esteem and building up self-esteem. So I'm laughing because yeah. you're like, you know, you sucked a dick. <laughs> like, that yeah. is cracking yeah. me up I right meant to now. say a strange you know. Oh, anyway. <laughs> you know, you had the strange, you know. Yes. I, I read this one thing on Facebook, one of those stupid memes that every hand that you've ever shaken has had a dick in it. <laughs> yep. Uh, but these days so we're funny. washing our hands like crazy. So we're all okay. Oh, shit, and not shaking hands. So. so, you know. Yeah. Don't be gross. <laughs> Oh my goodness, Casey, we'll have to do this again um, because I still have lots of questions, but sadly, we are out of time. (laughs) I could talk to you forever. Like that's always the way we are. So Yeah. And maybe, I mean, I think we could do an entire series on how to handle the first first time you have sex, the first time you dance, your first work event, your first, I mean, oh my God, we could have a whole series on that. Absolutely. But uh, I want to hear more about a hundred day challenge, but that, what all that is. So we'll have to schedule another one and do a part two. Absolutely. Okay. It's so well, good listen, to talk to you. I'm going to leave links to all your stuff uh, so that people can find you. Um, I keep telling you privately, but I'll just say it publicly. Like your message is so clear and um, you have created this beautiful life. And so you have like knowledge is one thing, but applying it is something completely different. And, and I see that you have this beautiful life and you've done the work, right? And so you are a testament that recovery and healing can be done as you see fit. Right. So I just know that the ladies who are in your wheelhouse will benefit from spending time with you. So, oh, thank you so much. And thank you for this podcast. I mean, I love it. And I think it's so important for everyone to hear other people's stories because, as different as they are, the feelings are all the same. And you know, just to know you're not alone, I mean, whether wherever you find that connection and that that message from people. I mean, that's huge. Like there are so many women and men who have problems with drinking. I mean, it's so universal and it's like the thing that nobody ever talks about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are turning that ship. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a great day and we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. (laughs) 
One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.